Could we welcome, please, Neil McGregor to give museums and memory story that make a community? Welcome, Neil. Thank you, Simon, for that very, very generous uh, introduction. And I should like to start by joining you um, in acknowledging the traditional custodians of this land and my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. And that is, I think, quite a good place to start. It's a very striking thing for people visiting uh, Australia, the way in which all public events in museums and galleries begin with a recognition of a long history, a long story, a story which has to be acknowledged and which is part of every subsequent story. And that's really what I want to talk about tonight on International Museums Day. Why do museums matter? What is the role of a museum? And why do we care about them? And I want to argue that it's because Museums are the places where the long histories, the complex histories, are acknowledged, discussed, debated, and continued and changed. And that we need that more today than perhaps at any time in our history. And I want to start with a person who, for me, has become a focus of particular interest, Gertrude Langer. Uh, when I first visited Brisbane, about 25 years ago, uh, it was in the context of a lecture for Gertrude Langer. Many of you, I'm sure, uh, know uh, the story very well, how in 1938, as a Viennese Jew, she left Austria uh, in order to survive and wound up in Brisbane. And in Brisbane, having had to flee from her home, having had to abandon everything, started focusing on those things which would allow a new life to be made, focusing on the art that was being made here, focusing on the importance of art, on the importance of museums and of galleries in creating a new kind of community. It's a good moment, I think, to begin because the Jews in Austria, in Germany, in 1938, were being written out of the story. They were not part of the story of that country, of those countries. They had no place in the narrative. And that is, again, a question that we can see being raised and an assertion being made today. And the point is, what is the narrative? What is the story of the museum of all of us? And that's the story that really lies at the heart of the creation of the British Museum. And I want to start there. I want to start the middle, early years of the 18th century and beginning with a dinner plate. What you're looking at is a dinner plate uh, made in the 1740s in China for Admiral Lord Anson. In the 1740s, Anson famously circumnavigated the globe. He set off with a couple of uh, naval ships and uh, beginning uh, going west uh, across the Atlantic and round Cape Horn, uh, somewhere off the west coast of South America, uh, around Peru, uh, Panama, he managed to raid some Spanish ships, stealing a great deal of silver. That funded the voyage. He then crossed the Pacific and, using the stolen silver, ordered a dinner service. Uh, porcelain could be found only in China at that point. He ordered the Grand China de Porcelain uh, Dinner Service and brought it home. He was made it, uh, it was it with the arms of the title that he had just acquired. It is an extraordinary dinner plate. Uh, in the middle is uh, the Pandanus tree uh, that he'd seen in the Pacific. Every, dinner, every plate in the service had a different plant, a different seam from a different place in the voyage. And on the top, right on the rim, on the right, uh, is uh, Canton, and on the rim on the left is Plymouth. So every day, Anson could dine off a different part of the world he'd visited, but always between China and England. It's something that nobody could have done before the early 18th century. That moment when, the, for the first time, because of shipping, 
because of navigation skills, because of the discovery of longitude, chronometers. You could sail around the world and think about the world as one. The first moment, I think, where you could really talk about a narrative embracing all of us. And Anson's dinner plate is the perfect demonstration of everything that went into that. Curiosity, violence, greed, ambition, and also a new way of thinking about the world. And the centre of that new way of thinking about the world was London. London in the 1750s, <coughs> 1740, 1750, by far the biggest city in Europe, by far the richest city in Europe, uh, shipping coming in and out, going all around the world, and the city, the only city in Europe of that scale that didn't have a university. The point being that Oxford and Cambridge had, of course, always maintained their privilege. They'd blocked every attempt to have a university in London. And the big question, how do you inform a public about the way in which the world is changing? How do you make a citizen of London into a citizen of the world? And the answer was, you start collecting objects from all over the world, but from people like Anson, and you put them together and you put them into a museum. And the result was, in 1753, the British Museum. It was the first time anyone had attempted to put in one building objects from all over the world, so that you could think about the story of humanity that embraced everybody. And when one thinks about the scale of the ambition, it is an astonishing one. It was to be aimed at universality, uh, it was largely uh, the result of trading ships and then later enriched by empire. And it was from the beginning to be open, free to everybody, native and foreign in the terms of the Parliamentary Act, probably the only time that the British ever referred to themselves as the natives, uh, but a very important moment and an ideal that survives and is, I think, as important now as it was then. And as you all know, what's in it is indeed from all over the world. The Rosetta Stone, uh, the result of the conflicts with the French in the Middle East, uh, in Egypt in the 1790s, the object that allowed the deciphering of ancient uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics because the text in hieroglyphic and in Greek um, together. Uh, many other uh, ancient uh, Egyptian objects uh, one of the greatest collections, in fact, the greatest collection in the world outside Cairo uh, to enable the study of uh, Egyptian ideas of society, life, and death, producing the very famous uh, cartoon in Punch uh, that I always thought there must be more to the afterlife than hanging around the British Museum. And it is, of course, not just the ancient world. The first objects to come from Oceania, from the Pacific, uh, this was long thought to be the shield that Cook had picked up at Botany Bay in 1770. It's now not uh, uh, so certain. But the discovery of this new world in the Pacific brought and shown to be looked at and compared, and also uh, from all other parts of the world, this magnificent uh, turquoise double-headed snake, probably meant to be worn round the neck, which the Spaniards brought back from uh, Mexico after the conquest of Mexico in the 1520s from the northeast coast of uh, Canada, uh, these great poles. All of them in the center, all of them in one building so that you can set off from the center of the British Museum to explore the world and to make your own story of it. It's the story that every visitor is required to make for themselves. You can visit the world through time. You have to decide what the narrative is. One visitor to the reading room, which is in the center of here, the great famous reading room uh, of, uh, built in the 1850s, uh, made his uh, view of the world very clear because it was here that Karl Marx wrote Das Kapital. And it's perhaps only here that he could have, only here could he have looked at the whole world and tried to establish a system, a narrative that held it uh, all together. And in the museum later, 
we have objects like this uh, showing the triumph of the red laborer uh, trampling on the letters of Capital, um, which were going to uh, were under his feet as the new dawn breaks and the world, uh, the, the sun rises uh, over the new world. It is the purpose of the place, it's the purpose of museums, to let citizens become more than citizens of just their own place, but citizens of the world they're inhabiting at the moment. And that, of course, is why the joke uh, cartoon uh, about can't think why it's called the British Museum when there's very little British material in it is that it was never meant of course to be a story of Britain but it was meant to be for the British people it's called the British Museum because it's not the Royal Museum it was made by Parliament for the citizen for everybody to make their story and to make sense of the world uh, that they inhabit and for the British citizen. And that's one of the places that I think is worth pausing because the collection was made, begun in the 1750s for, of course, an essentially European British population looking at the whole world. But that population has been transformed. As you all know, uh, in recent years, the numbers of, immigration, of immigrants in Britain has been very high since the war, and the population of London is now, the population of Britain is now, a very different population. When the museum ran a series of exhibitions and debates about African debt uh, about 10 years ago, uh, this enormous discussion and debate on the front lawn of the museum drew, as you see, very large numbers of British Africans. Uh, when the museum celebrated the ending of the transatlantic slave trade um, in 2007, the 200th anniversary, you can see from the crowd the number of Afro-Caribbeans who are now Londoners. And when we presented the Bengali uh, festivals and culture traditions around the goddess Durga, you can see that Londoners now are a very various lot that the British citizen of today is inevitably a citizen of the world. And that, I think, is what museums have got to do, to create a narrative for the new populations, the new citizens. This is, to go back to where we began with Gertrude Langer, the great challenge for today. All of us live in societies where the question is, who are we? Who are we? Who are the others? Immigration identity has become one of the central questions, one of the most bitter political debates. And the question of who are we is a question that museums are, I think, uniquely able to address. It can talk about the traditions, the stories of all the parts of our current population, trying to argue that with many different identities, many different stories, we can share one story of the new community, the society that we are. That the places where these things are shown, where these stories are told, are spaces for all citizens. And it is, I think, something that museums uniquely are able to do. That question of who are we and how do we relate to the world is, I think, more acute now than it has been for a long time. Certainly in Europe, that question of European identity, identity within European countries in the face of globalization has become a central and a burning topic of uh, discussion and disagreement. And that's above all because of the consequences of empire and the making of that one world, that global world. And I want to look at some of the ways in which a museum, I want to start with the British Museum, can address that kind of question. What, it, what the consequences of empire are and how they force a different way of thinking, 
and then what happens at the end of them. And I want to start with the first of the European empires, the oldest of them all, um, which is the Portuguese. The extraordinary phenomenon, as you know, from the middle of the 15th century of Portuguese ships sailing eventually round Africa into the Indian Ocean and eventually um, arriving in India and uh, Goa and then going on uh, ultimately to Japan while crossing <coughs> uh, uh, the Atlantic as well to Brazil and the division of the world, as you know, between Spain and Portugal with um, virtues, as you can see on this map, Portugal getting virtually everything that mattered um, except the, the West of the Americas. This is the first moment at which the direct contact from Europe to the Far East can happen and a world can be encountered and experienced and brought back that couldn't be there before. And in 1515, the, uh, the Portuguese are established, as you see, at Bombay. And the Sultan of Gujarat, just to the north of Bombay, decides that he wants to send a present to the King of Portugal, a demonstration of something that only the Sultan of Gujarat can send and that will show the new world, the Indian world, that has been discovered by the Europeans. And so he decides to send to the King of Portugal a rhinoceros, the most extraordinary idea that could be imagined. Um, this is an animal that, of course, is, uh, the, that, uh, is found in uh, uh, Gujarat, uh, not common in Europe, highly valued. And so the Viceroy of Bombay has to send the rhinoceros from Bombay to Lisbon. 1515, you know the size of a rhinoceros. You also know the size of a sailing ship in which the Portuguese could travel and had got to India. And you can imagine what the captain felt like when he was told that he was going to take back a rhinoceros. And the huge question of how you keep a rhinoceros on board ship, how you tie it down and what you feed it, and also, of course, the journey that has to be gone. Uh, this is the return, uh, this is the, the route that has to be, that has to be taken. Um, and they stop, as you can see, at various points uh, on the way around, um, particularly stopping uh, at St Helena uh, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. What would you feed a rhinoceros with? Well, of course, it normally would be eating uh, grass of various sorts, but you can't carry enough. So this wretched animal is fed rice uh, all the way, huge quantities of rice. Um, had they stayed at St Helena a little longer, they would, of course, have met the next celebrated guest, uh, who was Napoleon, um, who arrived a couple of centuries later. But they go on and they get to Portugal. And there, this animal makes a sensation. And this is the first time since the Roman Empire that Europeans have seen a live rhinoceros. And it causes a total sensation. It's the most famous animal in the continent. And the King of Portugal decides that, as this is the case, he must give it to the most important person. So he decides he'll send the rhinoceros on to the Pope. So the animal gets back on a boat sets off round uh, Gibraltar, and the boat sinks on the way to Italy, and the rhinoceros with it. And this is the image that Europe ultimately makes of the world beyond. This is the great image made by Alfred, uh, Albrecht Dürer, the German artist in Nuremberg in 1515. And it's been in the British Museum since its foundation in 1753. And it is an extraordinary emblem, I think, of how we all have to address the world we don't know. Dürer never saw this animal. He was staying, living in Nuremberg, central Germany, hundreds of miles away. But of course, he knew about it, and he'd heard about it, and he asked for descriptions to be sent. 
No photographs, of course, even less any selfies with rhino. Uh, the descriptions get sent from Lisbon to Nuremberg and with presumably sketches, and he invents the rhino. One of the things that he's told is that it's a very fierce animal, and you can see how brilliantly he suggests that by the way the horn is pressing against the frame one side. It can only just be held in the frame, just it must can only just have been held in the boat. He was told that it's got scaly skin that looks like armor, which is taken very literally. So it does look exactly like a plate of armor. And then the rest, he just had to make up. And I think this emblem, this image, is really what every museum is about. It's about the image you have to make of something you don't properly understand. There's a bit of information. You have some elements of fact, and then you've got to make up the rest. And of course, you know that this is a ridiculous image. It doesn't have that um, funny little second horn um, on its back. Um, it doesn't look like this, but it does sort of look like this. And you need to have an image. You need to be able to have an idea of the world beyond your experience. And using the little bits of the experience, uh, you develop an image. And it's what all of Europe has to do from now on. It has information coming back from all over the world, and it's got to make an idea of itself. And this image is so powerful, people find it such a strong image because it's on woodblock, it can be reprinted many, many times, that it remains for all of Europe the image they want, even though they know when they see rhinoceroses later, this is not what it looks like. So when 200 years later, uh, in Dresden, the King of Saxony wants to try porcelain, he's discovered how to make porcelain like the Chinese, he decides to try to make a porcelain rhinoceros to show that Europe can compete with China and with an Indian animal, and he makes a rhinoceros that looks exactly like the Dura uh, print. The, I, the image that is received remains a terrifically strong image. And to change those ideas is the work of centuries. It is, as I think, the, what, what, the, what the experience of Europe engaging with the world, exploring the world, trying to make sense of it, is at the very beginning of empire, and it's one bit of that experience that is now universal and that we all still keep trying to do, to make sense of the changing new world. At the other end of the Portuguese empire, at the other end of the imperial experience, or maybe the other side of it from the very beginning, is the violence and the brutality that enabled the Portuguese to establish themselves in Bombay, and which was present at the very end of the Portuguese empire, particularly in Mozambique. When the Portuguese left after the revolution um, uh, in the 1970s in Portugal, the country descended into civil war. And that was one of the things the British Museum decided we had to try to document. We could document many stages of the early phase of empire from all European countries. But how did we document what had happened as the empires collapsed at the end of the 20th century and Africa at the end of the 20th century? A world that mercifully most Europeans didn't encounter of civil war and violence. And we eventually decided that the way we might record that, this other, this end of empire, was with this object. It is, as you see, a chair made up of guns. But it has a very particular history. The civil war in Mozambique at the end of the Portuguese empire in the 1970s and 80s ran through into the 1990s. Uh, well over a million people were killed, hundreds of thousands maimed, displaced the whole society reduced and destroyed by violence. When eventually peace came, one of the questions was what do you do with the weapons that had been circulating? How do you demilitarize a country after that? 
Of course, you want the weapons to be handed in, but how do the people know that they've been decommissioned? It's a problem that was very obvious in Ireland after the war uh, there. The Bishop of South uh, Mozambique had the brilliant idea that people should hand in their weapons and in return they would be given something valuable in return, like a sewing machine or a plough, so that you would turn, he called it swords into ploughshares. But he also wanted to show the weapons that had been decommissioned. And one of the traditions in Southern Africa, across Africa indeed, is that when you conquer your enemy, you make, take his weapons, usually spears, and you make it into a throne on which you sit. So you, the victor, sit on the throne of the weapons of your defeated enemy. And he asked sculptor Kester to make a throne for peace to sit in out of the weapons of the Civil War. A very powerful image in itself. It's a very disturbing object because it's domestic in so many ways and then so shocking when you get close to it. But when you look even more closely, it's even more disturbing because if you carry out, as it were, a curatorial investigation of the different guns, you discover quite quickly, I hope you can see some of those were names, that every one, every part of this throne, all the guns were made in Europe. Uh, the two large ones at the back, the butts at the back, are old Portuguese rifles from the First World War, the old colonial occupier. All the rest come from the communist world, uh, from Czechoslovakia, from Korea, North Korea, from Russia. And what is clear is that the civil war in Africa, the wars in Africa at the end of the 20th century, could not have happened without weapons from Europe. This was, of course, a war played out as proxy war of the Cold War. And this comes from one part of Mozambique, which was supported by the Soviets. If we had taken a, weapon, a chair from another part, all the weapons would have come from Britain, France, and the United States. It would have been the same narrative. It's what I think objects and museums can do very, very powerfully. The memories, the stories that we don't want to confront, the stories that are a critical part of the world as it is today, and which changed the world for many people, and which the objects embody, and which the stories can be told in the museum. Um, and this object became, in the British Museum, a very powerful symbol of reconciliation. And indeed, very shortly after it was shown, uh, around 2000, it went to Northern Ireland on a Good Friday to commemorate the Good Friday Agreement when the weapons were uh, fell out, stopped being used, and decommissioning began. It went to Coventry Cathedral for a service of reconciliation uh, with on the 11th of November to mark the end of the, the, the war with Germany. Um, always carrying the same message and a very powerful symbol uh, in, in, indeed. It's a wonderful object to have in the museum because it can travel so easily because of what it's made out of. In a sense, if it falls apart, you simply bolt it together again. Uh, it doesn't really matter. But very pleasingly, the museum colleagues in Mozambique asked if it could go back to Mozambique, having taken on this extra meaning of what it had uh, symbolized in conflict in Europe uh, uh, and, uh, and beyond. It's an attempt to create a new story of who we are. It's about a nation trying to pull itself together. And that is what I want to look at now. The question of what, who are we and how do we then articulate that through our museums? And it's a question that in Europe at the moment is focused on entirely one question, Islam. And is Islam part of the European story? And the latest chapter, one of the most striking chapters, rather unexpectedly begins in Australia, where the invention uh, took place of the burkini, 
the full body covering costume, which appealed, as you know, to many Muslim women in that it let them bathe with a high degree of modesty, but to take part in the life of the society around them. Um, uh, it seems to have, I'm sure you know more about this than I, it seems to have been uh, used in Australia without any uh, fuss or anybody really paying particular attention. And then in 2015, it suddenly exploded on Europe because Muslim women started wearing it on the beaches of the Riviera. And it caused riots. Now, when I was a child going to the beach in France, the police would arrive only because people weren't wearing enough. That was uh, the offence. These women were being taken off the beaches of the Riviera because they were wearing too much. And because that wearing too much was a public assertion that they were Muslim. And for France, that is something that is not allowed. The French state is very clear that it is a state where there is only one allegiance you can proclaim, which is to the French state. You cannot proclaim publicly that you are part of any other, uh, particularly religious group, in the public sphere. It had never really been put to the test in many Catholic areas, of what one, how one might show a Christian faith. In the context of the current uh, xenophobia of Europe, it became a flashpoint. Eventually, the Supreme Court in France ruled that the Burkini was constitutional, but it had become a great focus of debate. And the identity of France suddenly became polarized. Could you be a good Muslim and a public Muslim and French? And here you see Paris in the spring in 2017, not the usual images of Paris in the spring. These are people in Clichy protesting because they don't have a mosque. These are French citizens who want also to be publicly acknowledged as Muslims. It has led to a debate right across Europe. Can we accommodate in our story of who we are a religion which for centuries has been thought of as the religion of the other? Can we make a new story and how do we tell it? And everywhere the problem is the same. In peaceful Switzerland, uh, sorry, be, and, sorry, everywhere the problem is the same. And it's a problem that has become dramatically worse, of course, and even more distressing in the context of the migrations across the Mediterranean for Lampedusa. These people arriving in Europe, having left everything behind in order to be safe, coming to a place that doesn't want them, and even if they're not Muslim, they are regarded as Muslim by very many of the receiving countries, or the countries indeed that won't receive them. The sense of an invasion by an outside body. This is the, one of the tragic scenes of Lampedusa. You've seen them all. And is one of the most disturbing aspects of our narrative in Europe. Are these people part of our story? And, or can we tell a story that allows them to become part of it? Switzerland, in tw uh, 2009, decided to have a referendum on whether you could have a minaret or not. They were concerned that mosques were appearing in public, public statement of Islam in traditionally Christian Switzerland. And even though this minaret is obviously trying very hard to look like a Swiss church steeple, uh, the referendum decided you were not allowed to make uh, minarets in Switzerland. They're now banned. And in Germany, as you know, the great marches against immigration, against what they call the Islamization of Europe, uh, in Dresden particularly, uh, with this chilling image of Mrs. Merkel wearing uh, a hijab and on the Reichstag, the parliament building behind uh, the Muslim crescent. It would be interesting to put this image beside the image of Jacinta Ardern wearing a hijab in a quite different context and a different political debate. But in Europe, this is now absolutely central. Uh, who are we? And where does it fit into our story? And it's a question that, of course, has a particular resonance in Germany above all, 
remembering what happened in the 1930s and what happens when a group are identified particularly by religion and declared not to be part of the story. And it's why the role of museums is, I think, such an important one. Because the role of museums, like the British Museum, has been steadily to say that the story is the story of everybody. Everything must be there. The new British citizens must find their place here. They are part of one story. And like the Louvre, like the museums in Germany, the narrative is of one story. That's something that, as it's World Museums Day, I think it's worth looking at how different that is elsewhere because it's a very European model. The belief that we have to hold all of our society together in one story. And it's the model, of course, that's been followed in the great museums uh, in Australia. But in the United States, it's a different story. Uh, the mall in Washington, uh, where the great, the capital of the front, and the great Smithsonian institutions gathering the knowledge of humanity and the collections of humanity to present the story of us all in the enlightened world of a new civic society uh, of the United States. And those institutions all in the language of classical architecture, the language of the 18th century ideal enlightenment view of humanity together, rational, measured, and the stories that embrace us all in these buildings. But we all know that, of course, the 18th century narrative didn't include everybody. And in the United States, of course, it particularly didn't include the native indigenous peoples or the slaves that came to work. And one of the most striking developments in museums, I think worldwide, of the last uh, 30 years, has been the addition of two new museums in the mall. The first, the Museum of the American Indian, which could hardly make a greater statement that we are not part of this story. We are not part of your story. This is a separate narrative. The building is, of course, designed to look uh, to echo uh, aspects of Native American traditions. And in it are narratives of the many, many different indigenous societies of America, North and South, with a great deal of contemporary, inf of, of documentary information, photographs, and the message, very clear. But the message that this is a story that belongs to them and a separate story. And further down the mall in Washington, another building, uh, the building of the African American, designed to echo a crown from West Africa, and again, designed to make very clear that this is a story that is not part of the others. This is the story of the African Americans, not part of the general museum of American history, and again, a museum telling of the struggle of one community to assert their rights, their equal rights with the rest of society. It is, I think, a question that's a very important one for everybody. These two stories are stories that are not presented as part of the overall American narrative. They are the separate stories. And we all need to ask, I think, it's clearly a big question in Australia at the moment in presenting indigenous cultures. Are we presenting separate narratives or are we presenting different strands of one narrative? Can you make one narrative? Is it best to have several narratives but to show them as equal? And almost the only place where this can happen is the museum. The museum is almost the only public symbol of reconciliation of telling the history, telling the injustice, acknowledging the role, and then working towards something else. 
And it's an extraordinary role for the museum, quite different from the 18th century beginnings or the idea of presenting beautiful things and conserving them. This is the museum as a place of atonement, as a place of reconciliation, and a place where everybody has to decide what the national narrative is. Who are the we? Are there several we's, or are we all the same one? It's a big, big challenge. I want to finish by looking at two examples that are going in very different directions, addressing that question, who are we? And how does the museum tackle it? And they're both very topical ones. First is in Ramallah, in the occupied West Bank, the museum, the Palestinian Museum. A very particular challenge for a community. Who are we? the Palestinians, in the context of the occupied West Bank. You know as well as I the complexities of that occupation. You know as well as I the debates about the legal, the ethical situation, past and present. And you also know that for the Palestinians, one of the key questions is how do they decide who they are what holds them together, what they share. And this museum exists to articulate the memories of the Palestinians. And memories are, of course, our identity. When we lose our memory, we stop existing as the people we are. There's no real collection. They put on temporary exhibitions. And the exhibition I want to look at is the apparently very genteel one of embroidery. But this is not ladies tatting. Uh, in, in the way you might expect uh, genteelly producing tablecloths or napkins. This is tatting with a purpose. Um, and the purpose is, of course, very clear. It is part of rallying a community for the fight for liberation. And what they've done is show dresses made by Palestinian women over a long period, but, but particularly since... 1947-48, the flight from what is now Israel and the experience of living in the occupied West Bank. And to my mind, a very fascinating decision that the best way to do this was through clothes and embroidery. For the reason that this is all done by women and it's popular art, it's there for something that expresses the ideas, the views of a whole society. It's also done slowly. This takes time. And that means that you have to, this is it's a considered view of a population. And it tells some of the most disturbing stories, um, as you could imagine. After the, what the Palestinians call the Nakba, the disaster of uh, the first uh, Arab-Israeli war, the first refugees arrive in Ramallah, and many of them had nothing. They are, again, refugees, which is, again, I think the presence of Gertrude Langer is uh, among us. Um, the woman the, who was clearly, this is a, a dress that was given by a woman of Ramallah to a refugee, but it's clear that the woman she gave it to was bigger than she was. And so from the camp, in the camp, this was uh, let out and extended. You can see the patch put in. And you can see when you look closely at the patch that what it's been extended with is the cloth from the bags in which emergency rations of food, uh, wheat particularly, flour, were given by the United Nations. This, the, so the, the, the emergency food has been part of the, 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 the sack Part of the made part of the fabric to allow the dress to be worn. And so it goes on. This very personal, very intimate narrative of a people, uh, first of all, fleeing or expelled, and then living uh, in the context of the Intifada. Under the Intifada, it was forbidden to carry emblems, wave flags of the Palestinian uh, Liberation Organization, or indeed the Palestinian flag. So what the women did was, in order to go on the demonstrations, was to 
embroider the dresses so that they were walking flags. Uh, they were walking demonstrations. You see the flag on the sleeve there. And again and again, beautifully done, very slowly, elaborately working out the colours of the Palestinian uh, flag, uh, the words, the emblems, and sometimes particularly fine details. I think you can see here um, the bottom of bird and on either side in the centre, a gun. This is embroidery as the prelude to armed insurrection. It is about a memory and about a hope. And I find very disturbing, the more disturbing because of the medium, just as the throne of weapons is the more powerful because the weapons have been domesticated. Here, the fact that this is the most peaceful, tranquil occupation turned in this direction makes it the more powerful. It's all by women except there's only one circumstance in which men in Israel, in the Palestine, Palestine embroider, and that is when they are in Israeli jails. And so exhibited objects, uh, I suspect any woman in the audience who is an embroiderer, or any man who is an embroiderer, would uh, know that, uh, see that the, some of this is fairly crude, but the point of having it and the point of showing it is, of course, not as great embroidery, but as evidence of another aspect of the Palestinian experience. It raises difficult questions, uncomfortable questions, but it is one of the things a museum can explore. Who are we? Who are the Palestinians? And what is their relation to the people with them? And can that story be part of something else? To finish, something you will please know a little more cheerful. Um, Berlin. The building you uh, look at doesn't exist, uh, but it will soon, and it will soon be open. It is right in the heart of Berlin, and what's called the Museum Island, and it is one of the, uh, this is the project that Simon was talking about earlier on, the Humboldt Forum. Uh, named after the two brothers, Alexander and Wilhelm von Humboldt. Alexander, the great traveler, the man who discovers uh, the Humboldt current of South America, the man who really is the precursor of Darwin in looking um, at the way plants and nature work in an ecosystem. His brother, Wilhelm, who explores the languages of the world. Two global thinkers. And after them, this, is, this palace, this, this museum is going to be named. The history of the site is extraordinary and, I think, unique in Europe. Um, it stands where this building stood. You can see the dome that you see here is at the top of the building uh, in the centre of the screen. And we're right in the heart of Berlin, and this was the royal palace of the king and of the emperor, the Hohenzollern royal palace built in 1710 to celebrate the fact that they'd become kings of Prussia. And part of the laying out of the city was that everything would converge on this building. And the great avenue that you see running up top right is the avenue of Unter den Linden. And at the top of it, as the city gate, is the Brandenburg Gate, which you all know. The Brandenburg Gate is there to lead you to the royal palace. The Royal Palace was bombed in the Second World War, burnt out, but could have been rebuilt. Um, this is what it looks like in 1945. Um, but it's no worse in, in its condition than many other buildings that were restored. But in 1951, the Soviets decide that this palace was the symbol of German militarism and must be destroyed. This was the Prussian imperialist militarist capitalist enemy in one building. And so in 1951, uh, it is blown up. You see how much survived. And the whole thing disappears. It was a great 18th century building. Many of the interiors had actually survived. And the whole thing um, disappears. 
Then comes, of course, this is part of the moment of the Cold War, the division of Berlin, the wall runs through the Brandenburg Gate, and the palace, of course, looking down that way, is in the east, and that empty space is in the east. The heart of the city is in the east. On that site, the Soviets, or the East German government, the German Democratic Republic, decide they will build the palace of the republic. They'll replace the imperial royal palace with the palace of the republic, um, the palace uh, of the German Democratic Republic. Now, you would imagine that that means that this is the place, the center of power, as a royal palace might be. But in fact, not at all. Because as you know, in any Soviet communist system, power doesn't reside in the parliament. Parliament's role is an entirely decorative one to rubber stamp what's already been decided by the party. There is a parliament chamber here of the sort you'd expect, but much more important, here was the only decent bowling alley in East Berlin. Here was the only decent discotheque in East Berlin. The bar the, where the best concerts were held. When you went courting, this is where you went. After your wedding, this is where you had your party. So for the citizens of East Germany and for Berlin, this was not the symbol of Soviet oppression and the Stasi, as one might expect. Those buildings were somewhere else. This was the place of many happy memories. When the wall came down, uh, this great moment you all know of, the, of 1989, the great uh, moment when the, when the wall collapses, um, Berlin reunited, Berlin the capital of the new Germany. Berlin needs a parliament. Uh, Germany needs a new parliament for the whole of Germany in Berlin. That's to be the Reichstag. What do you do with this? And of course, for the people, most of the people from the West, this is not what you want. They want to get rid of it because it's the symbol of the Stasi world. Parliament said, well, this was always a sham. Let's get rid of it. And there's a great debate. And of course, the East Germans on the whole don't want this to happen. They want it to stay. <laughs> they want it to stay as part of their world. It was a bit of their world that had value. And they feel the demolition of this will be the denial of 40 years in which they managed to keep something of worth going, even though they were living under an oppressive regime. Very understandable. There's a great debate. And then eventually, it's declared that the building has such bad asbestos that it's going to have to be demolished. Well, that response is exactly the response of East Germany, um, except it was much louder. Nobody believed it. But it happened. The building was demolished. This is the central cause. The steel was sold to Dubai and is now embodied in the Burj Khalifa, the tallest tower in the world. And this site was raised, again, completely clear. This lets you see, show you exactly where it is. Um, where the spray divides at the bottom of the picture um, is, you see, is the beginning of the museum island. This wonderful concentration of museums where all the great cultures of the world, all the great Roman collections, Egyptian, Mesopotamian, whatever, are all in the different buildings. This is where Nefertiti is and so on. And then beyond, you can see the empty space, that great green empty space where first the palace had stood and then the Palast de République. What should be done with this space? The German parliament decided and as we all know, parliaments can do pretty peculiar things. Um, they decided that the facades of the old royal palace should be reconstructed because that had been the center of the city. That's what everything converged on. And they should go back to that. And then after that came the question, well, if you do uh, reconstruct the facades, and this is as it was in uh, 1910, uh, what do you put inside? long debates, and then eventually, and this I think was a, a stroke of genius, the idea that in this building, after the European collections, the great 
classical collections, the great Middle Eastern collections, you should put the collections from Africa, Oceania, and the Americas, and Asia. All the non-European collections, and particularly those collections which the Nazis had the most despised. And they would be the inhabitants of the royal palace. And here would be a magnificent symbol of the new Germany, that at the heart of the city, at the very center of power and all the associations of the past, you put your commitment to a totally new story of the world, a story of the world where Europe is not in the middle and where the other cultures, the cultures that think of the world otherwise and which you need to respect and engage with now in a new way, they will be in the old royal palace. I think it's worth pondering because it is an extraordinary statement. And it's, if you like, turning right round to the Dürer rhinoceros, that German idea of the rest of the world, how you imagine the rest of the world, is suddenly brought to a quite different position that the real things from all over the world will be here and from those cultures that you know least of and have, on the whole, uh, until in many ways, not respected. Uh, the questions then, so this, will, this is what it will uh, uh, look like, as I say, when, uh, when it uh, reopens. Um, uh, it's, uh, at the moment, it's under scaffolding. Uh, but when you go in through that door with that main portal, as you can see on the right, you come into a courtyard like this, and a courtyard which, as you can see on one side, is a reconstruction, and the rest completely modern. And here comes again the great German question about the story. Who are we? What is our story? Because some Germans complained this will look as though the original was not destroyed. And that will mean people will forget that this needed to be destroyed. And so where fragments of the old building survived, as you can see the body of the fame carrying the trumpet over the arch, they've been put in but left in a different stone. So that everybody looking at this is reminded that here was a great palace that was destroyed because Germany, that civilization, went so astray morally and ethically to produce the Third Reich that it needed to be destroyed. A building that the Germans want to use to tell the story to themselves as much as to others about the fragility of civilizations and the fragility of institutions. An extraordinary purpose for a museum, the building itself to be an ethical warning. And what of the Palace de République? Well, we've decided that in this new building, there will be many elements from the Palace de République. Uh, you will be able to see things from the disco, from the bowling alley, uh, other elements that will remind you that here was not just once a royal palace, but a place where the people of East Berlin uh, found some semblance of normal life under a very serious dictatorship. It's a building, therefore, that is also a story of national reconciliation. Who are we? We are East and West Germans of the past, the new Germans of the future. And we are thinking in a different way about the world. And in this strange narrative of Germanness and who we are, we will show some of the greatest things from other cultures. This one, the great heads from Benin, um, looted by the British in the punitive raid of 1898, then put up for auction and bought by Berlin. And here, the Germans want to confront another problem because some of the material from Africa is from Africa that was German colony and where the questions of how the Germans behaved in their colonies are now being examined with all the rigor with which the Germans have examined their history under the Third Reich. And so a throne, this wonderful throne made of beads from Cameroon, given, in inverted commas, I think one has to say, by the king of Cameroon to Kaiser Wilhelm in the early 1900s. 
as a mark of friendship from one sovereign to another. Of course, one sovereign was very weak and in Africa, and the other sovereign was very strong and had guns in Africa. And what is going on in the gift is perfectly clear. But it's a remarkable object. And in one way, it was given. Should it be there? What does it say about the relationship? What does it say about the relationship now between Africa and Europe? And much more difficult, the two most brutal moments of German colonial history. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, then German Tanganyika, where in the 1890s, 1900s, the Germans brutally put down uh, uh, an uprising, um, killing uh, tens of thousands of Tanzanians. And on the right, even worse, in what is now Namibia, German Southwest Africa, where the German army drove the Herrera and the Nama people into the desert in order that they might starve. Quite clearly, an attempt at a genocide. Big debate in Germany. Should any object acquired in these circumstances be exhibited? If so, how? It's a debate you're familiar with in a different context and in different registers here uh, in, in Australia. How should material acquired at moments of great inequality or in conditions of violence now be exhibited and discussed? And that is really the great challenge for this building because one of the purposes is that it be used as a place, a forum for debate about Germany's history and what that means uh, for the future. And when it opens, uh, and it will open uh, at the end of this year and then progressively in stages, it will, I think, be a unique, a unique place because it will not just be a place where objects are shown, but where the whole question about how objects should be shown, whether they should be shown, will be discussed with colleagues, with people from all around the world. It's one of the great demonstrations, I think, of what a museum can do, can be, and the role it can play in redefining that question, who are we, and how do we relate to what we were and what we're going to be. A bit solemn to finish on, so very, very quickly, and very close to home, the question of what it means to be Scottish. <laughs> and the fact that the stories museums tell don't actually need to be true. In fact, the most powerful ones are not true. Uh, when, uh, after the Stuart rebellions, the Jacobite rebellions, the great reluctance of many Scots to be part of the union with England, when eventually that subsides in 1820, George IV goes to Edinburgh. George IV, for the first time, advised by Walter Scott, wears a kilt. This causes hilarity on all sides. He wears pink tights and a kilt. And the Scots begin to invent a new thing of what it meant to be Scottish, what it means to be Scottish. And this is the moment at which this idea, which you all know, because of the traditional Scottish dress, is invented. Of course, people wearing kilts, the Highlanders, were always extremely poor and very rough. Lowlanders never wore kilts. Um, nobody in Edinburgh would ever have dared, wanted to wear a kilt, and it was everything you despised. Suddenly, that all turns round, and all the Scots decide that they want kilts, and in a way that has never, ever happened before, it was that every group of Scots would have a different kind of kilt, and the whole fantasy of the clan tartan is created, and this is mine. Um, <laughs> Now, we were, in fact, uh, cattle thieves um, of no great distinction. Um, but uh, uh, the, 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 the tartan is invented, and it becomes a story which everybody swallows. And it's sort of who we are. It's also of who we're not. It, you might think it's an exclusive story. But the extraordinary thing, to everyone's enormous surprise, is that in the great wave of immigrations, it's transpired that it's not. Anybody can register a tartan. And I want to finish with, to my mind, one of the happiest things of the result of a museum presenting a story and who are we and how do we become a new we with the Sikh tartan, <laughs> which is surely one of the greatest museum achievements of the world. And here you see a Scottish Sikh 
wearing the traditional Sikh tartan <laughs> and looking exactly like uh, a Scottish chief. It's what museums are, are for, the stories of who we are, how we embrace other people, and how we reshape ourselves for our future. And that's why Museums Day matters. Thank you very much. Thank you.